Chapter 8 of The Boy at the Back of the Class The Unexpected Adventure That weekend I decided I want to ask Mum some more of my 11 questions to see if she knew the answers. I waited until Sunday morning arrived because that is when I knew Mum wouldn't be too tired and I could ask her lots of things instead of just one or two things at a time. The only problem is I had to be extra, extra patient because every Sunday morning my mum spends at least one hour reading the Sunday morning paper. It's not a real Sunday paper because mum never buys them. She says you could buy a whole meal for the price of a Sunday paper these days. So instead, all through the week, she collects two of the biggest newspapers from the reference section of the library. And then on Saturday night, she brings them all home and gets them ready for the next day. She opens them out at the centre and puts them in order so that Monday's paper on top and Saturday's papers are at the bottom. And then she folds them together again like a great big book. It's too heavy to hold up and read 12 big newspapers in one go. So mum always reads it bent over the kitchen table as if she's doing homework. I don't like disturbing mum when she's reading the paper because she only gets to do it once a week. So I quickly finished my toast and milk and silently stared at her as she finished her breakfast. But grown-ups take an awfully long time to eat breakfast when they don't have to go to work. And on this morning, Mum seemed to be moving so slowly that you could hardly call it moving at all. I could hear the ticking of the kitchen clock getting louder and louder and my fingers and legs were getting bored of waiting. As soon as Mum took the last bite of her toast, I decided I couldn't wait any longer and said, Mum, where's Syria? The question made her look up straight away. What did you say, darling? Just, do you know where Syria is, Mum? I said. My Mum pushed her glasses and looked at me with her head to one side. And then she said, Syria is a country very far away from here, my love. Why do you want to know? I shrugged. That's where the new boy in our class is from. Ah, oh, she said, nodding. OK, tell you what, why don't you go and get the Atlas book and I'll show you. I nodded and ran to the living room trying to remember where I'd last put the Atlas book. It's hard finding a book in our house because we have so many of them. Mum loves collecting old books and reading them again and again. She takes the copies that are about to be thrown away by her library, so you could say she rescues them. The only problem is, we don't really have space for any more because our rooms are covered with piles of old books, even in the toilet. The Atlas book was big, and Mum always kept the very big books at the bottom shelf of our bookcase. So, I climbed over the back of the sofa and crawled down into the narrow gap head first to see if it was there. Luckily it was. I grabbed it and pulled it out. The Atlas book is one of the oldest books in the house and it's almost half as tall as me and just as heavy. So I dragged it along behind me into the kitchen and placed it with a bang onto the kitchen table. I watched as mum flipped to the index and then to a page near the middle. Um, here you go, she said, turning the map around to show me. This atlas is a little old, but I don't think the borders have changed that much. I let my finger meet hers where it said the word Syria in capital letters and looked at the strange shape of the country the new boy had run away from. It looked like a woman yawning and wearing a tiara and whose hair was being blown in the wind, except she was all pointy. Mum? Mm hmm? fruits do people from Syria like the most? I crossed my fingers and toes hoping she would know the answer because if she did then I would know the answers to three of my original 11 questions. I'd found out where the new boy was from and what language he would spoke and as a bonus had seen what his country looked like on a map and learned that he was good at football. Well let's see I, I don't really know I mean, I guess the same fruits as we do, and the exotic ones like dates and pomegranates. Your Auntie Selma used to make chicken with pomegranate seeds, do you remember? I shook my head, 
Oh, well, it was quite a while ago. It was before your dad had to leave us. But I think the dish you used to make was a Syrian one, or was it Lebanese? I can't remember, but here, you see? She said, pointing to a country next to Syria which had the word Lebanon on it. Lebanon and Syria are right next door to each other, so I guess they probably eat the same kind of fruits. Can we ring and ask her? My mum smiled. I can ask her the next time she calls. Remember, she lives here now. Her mum pointed to a much larger country lying above Syria called Turkey. It's a bit far and it'll be expensive to call her right now. But listen, we'll go and see her one day soon. And when we do, you can ask her and Uncle Turgay all about it in person. I nodded because I suddenly missed my Auntie Selma an awful lot. It's funny how you can go for long bits of time without even thinking of someone and then suddenly feel all wrong because you realise they're not around anymore. I feel like that about my dad sometimes. It feels horrible when I go to bed and realise I haven't thought about him all day, not even for a minute. But I always remember him at night before I go to sleep because that's when he used to tell me stories and do funny patterns on my forehead so it tickled. It's different with my auntie Selma though. She's not my real auntie, so I think it might be okay if I don't think about her every day. She is my best friend, my mum's best friend, because they like laughing at the same things. She has dimples, just like I do, and she always wears lots of sparkling bracelets and necklaces. She used to live two floors below us with Uncle Turge, and every Sunday night they would invite mum and dad and me down for dinner and give us all sorts of special things to eat like bread with spinach inside it and a special kind of tea that came in a small glass and didn't have any milk in it. I remember the tea because Dad let me taste it once, but I didn't like it at all. But then, after Dad died, Auntie Selma and Uncle Turge said they were leaving because the economy was bad. Grown-ups are always talking about the economy, especially in shops and at bus stops and on the news. And they always sound angry or sad when they talk about it. I hate the economy because it made Uncle Selma and Uncle Turge suddenly disappear. Just like Dad. They send us pictures and boxes sometimes in the post. And even though I like getting things from them because the stamp is so interesting, I can tell it makes Mum sad. Now there's an old lady living in their flat. She never speaks to anyone. I don't think Mum could ever be best friends with her, even if she wanted to. I thought about my question again. So, people from Syria like pommy, pom grain, pomegranate, mum corrected. Remember it like this. Uh, let's see. One half of a pom pom and a delicious letter E that your gran ate. Pomegranate. I nodded and I said the word out loud three times. Pomegranate, pomegranate, pomegranate. I love it when mum comes up with ways to help me remember how to spell a word. Last year I had to learn the word conundrum for a spelling test but kept forgetting how many nuns or uns there were in it. And then mum told me to close my eyes and picture a man called Co and a lonely nun banging on a drum. I've never spelt it wrong since. I thought about pomegranates and how they might be Ahmet's favourite food and how we might be missing them. So I asked... Mum, can we get one? One what, darling? A pomegranate, I said carefully. Mm, they're a bit expensive and you can't find them everywhere. How expensive? I'm not sure. About £1.50, I think. What? Nearly £2 just for one, I cried out. You could buy a whole packet of colouring pens and a rubber for that much money. Mum laughed. Yes, darling, for one, they come a long way to get into our supermarkets. And secondly, pomegranate's a really special fruit. It's like millions of tiny fruits all hidden away in a small ball. And you can eat it for days. Oh, they said, trying hard to think of what millions of one fruit inside a ball would look like. She looked at me and smiled. Do you want to see if we can find one? Shall we make that our adventure for today? I jumped up and nodded.
but can we get two? And why would you need two? I think Mum already knew the answer because her lips looked like she was about to smile. I didn't think she'd tell me off, even though pomegranates are so expensive, but you can never be too sure with grown-ups. Sometimes they don't tell you off, even when you've done something you know you shouldn't have. And other times, when you think you haven't done anything bad at all, they punish you twice as much. Michael says it's so they can keep us on our toes. I've never stood on my toes when I'm being told off, so I don't see how that works. I want to get two so I can give one to the new boy, I said. I've been giving him my sherbet lemons and sweets after school, but he doesn't like them much. Then I gave him an apple and an orange and he liked those better. And Miss Hemsey says that he's from Syria and that he only speaks... He only speaks... I hesitated trying to remember what Miss Hemsey said. Arabic? Mum asked, trying to help. I shook my head. Kurt... Kurt wish. I guessed, knowing it was wrong. Oh, Kurdish. I nodded. I see. I could tell Mum was interested in what I was saying because she'd leaned back in her chair and folded her arms. I thought maybe he'd like a fruit he used to have at home all the time before the dr bullies dropped bombs on everything and made him run away. I stopped, worried that Mum would think it was silly and maybe a waste of money buying food only to give it away. But she didn't. Instead, she said, I think it's a brilliant idea. Go and get ready and we'll head out on a pomegranate hunt. I got ready so quickly that morning that I think I must have beaten a world record. In five minutes, I'd pulled on my adventure jeans and an old Tintin jumper, packed my rucksack with a water bottle, an apple, a banana, put on my wellies, brushed my hair and emptied my piggy bank. I had exactly four pounds and 20 P saved up, so I took three pounds, hoping that just like my astronaut stationary set, I could find two pomegranates that were on sale. First, we went to the fruit store that was at the bottom of our high street. It's run by a man and a woman called Mr. and Mrs. Marbles, who like to shout, only a pound, fruit and veg, only a pound, to all the people that walk by. Their faces are always so red and smiling and they wear giant square shaped green belts around their waist which look empty but jingle loudly when they walk. Mrs Marbles helps people pick out the fruit they want and Mr Marbles puts them in a bag. We always buy our fruit and vegetables from them and I've never known them not to have anything we need. But when we asked them if they had a pomegranate they both shook their heads and told us to try the supermarket. So we walked up and over the hill to the supermarket. They had a fruit section that was as long as our house, but Mum couldn't see a pomegranate anywhere. We went over to a man who was stacking carrots and humming to himself and asked him if they had any pomegranates in store. He walked us over to an empty box. Sorry, love, looks like we've run out. You might want to try the bigger supermarket on the other side of town. Oh, OK, thank you. Mum looked down at me and sighed. Then she said, come on, the adventure continues. We hopped onto a bus and half, after half an hour landed at an even bigger supermarket. This one had a car park as big as a football field and corridors as long as the ones at school. But we still couldn't find a pomegranate anywhere. Let's ask someone, said Mum, they must have them. We walked around and found a man dressed in a suit who was standing by the sandwich section. He had a label on his jacket that said, Frank Smith, floor manager. I didn't know what a floor manager was, but I guess he had to make sure the floor was clean and help anyone who fell down to get back up again. But Mr Smith didn't look like the sort of person who would help anyone get up from the floor. He had lips that went downwards as if they never smiled and his hair looked wet as if a large bottle of oil had fallen on top of it. He was staring at the clipboard and muttering angrily to himself. Excuse me, um, Frank, is it? Hi, said Mum, smiling. The man gave my mum a cold nod before continuing to fill in a long form. We're looking for some pomegranates and we can't seem to find any, said Mum, smiling even more. We don't sell them here, said Frank, still looking at his clipboard. Oh, really? Any idea where we could find some? continued Mum. No. My mum looked at him for a few seconds and then said in her warmest voice, 
Thank you. You've really outdone yourself in helping someone today. Have a wonderful day. And grabbing my hand, she walked away. Mum, why were you so nice to him? I asked. He was horrible. He didn't even try and help us a little bit. Because you should never be horrible to someone who's being horrible to you, said Mum. Otherwise they win by making you just as bad as them. Now, come on, let's get back on the bus. There's another place I know we can try. By this time I was getting hungry, so while we were waiting for the next bus, I ate my banana. Hmm, said Mum, looking at her watch. It was nearly two o'clock and there were some dark grey clouds gathering in the sky. I'm afraid the next stop will have to be our last one, darling. It, looked like, it looks like it's going to start raining in a bit. A few seconds later, a very full bus pulled up in front of us and we squeezed on. I clung to Mum's coat because there weren't any empty seats and waited for our stop. I was worried because if this was our last try, then I had just one last chance to find a pomegranate. So I crossed my fingers and my toes and I made a wish that we would. The next place felt like an awfully long way away. And when we finally got there, it was filled with so many people we could hardly walk properly. There were lots and lots of market stalls lying in the middle of a big road, selling fish and meat and bed sheets and gold chains. There was a man with a microphone who was trying to sell perfumes like a game show host by shouting, roll up, roll up. And next to him was a woman shouting, Peter never picked potatoes as good as these before, buy them now before they go. I wondered who Peter was and how much money he made picking potatoes. But then I could smell onions and burgers being cooked somewhere which made my tummy rumble. I loved burgers, especially ones that have lots of fried onions and ketchup in them. But I wanted to save my money for the pomegranates. So I scrunched up my nose and tried not to smell anything at all. We visited every stall in the market from the beginning of the street right to the end. But even though we looked as carefully as we could, we couldn't find a single pomegranate anywhere. My mum had told me to look for a pinkish ball that looked like a very hard apple and which had a small crown on the top. But I couldn't find anything that looked even a little bit royal. Try the store up by the station, suggested one of the stall owners when mum asked for help. They have everything under the sun in there. They should have some. Thank you, said mum. She grabbed my hand and gave it a squeeze because she could tell I was starting to give up hope. Nearly there, she whispered. I can feel it. We walked for five minutes down the road and up to the station and found the shop. It was much smaller than the big supermarket with Frank, the horrible floor manager in it, but it was bright with lots of coloured lights and bowls and bowls of fruit and vegetables outside. It had everything you could think of. Peaches and plums, mangoes and bananas, kiwis and pears, yellow apples, red apples and pink apples and even a spiky pink and green fruit I'd never seen before. But we couldn't see any pomegranates, so we went inside and asked the man behind the counter. Ah, oh, nodded the man, scratching the tip of his nose. Pomegranate, I see for you. And talking out loud to himself, he hurried to a corner of the shop and quickly looked through some boxes. Much, much regret, he called out, holding up an empty box. No more, but we have delivery on Tuesday. The man came back and looked at us, and we looked at him. He had a large white beard and a moustache that was curly at the ends and was wearing a bright red turban. I liked him because his eyebrows were like hairy caterpillars that jumped up and down a lot when he spoke. Oh, well, said Mum. We tried, at least. The man looked at me. I think he must have noticed I was looking sad because he said, it is for little one. I looked up and nodded. And for my friend, he said, he's new in my class and he misses home and that's what he used to have. I see, he said, looking at me with a smile. Then he frowned as if he had just thought of something and suddenly pointing his finger at the ceiling, cried out, aha. He ran to a small door at the back of the shop and disappeared. Mum and I looked at each other in surprise. He's funny. I like him. He seems lovely, agreed Mum. After a few seconds, the man came back, but instead of returning to the counter, he came and stood in front of us. They're not perfect, but we'll be OK, he said. And whipping his hands out from behind his back, he held out 
two little pink balls, each with a crown on top. Oh, cried out Mum, clapping her hands. You have some. They are a little old. My wife, she says, they are not perfect 100%. So we don't sell. My wife, she knows everything about fruit, so I listen to her most. <gasps> They're perfect enough for us, laughed Mum, aren't they, darling? I nodded as the man gently handed them to me. You and your friend, you enjoy, please, he whispered and tapped me on the nose with a finger that had a golden ring and a large red stone on it. I looked down at the pomegranates. They were the size of grapefruits and had a hard peachy pink and brown skin that was as smooth and as shiny as polished glass. And both of them had a tiny flower on the top made up of exactly seven stiff brown petals. They were the best, most interesting thing I had ever seen. Mum took out her purse because that's where I'd put my pocket money. But the man shook his head and waved his hand. No, no, you must not. It is a gift for a little one. No, no, you must let me. But the man held up both his hands, which made Mum go quiet. And he put his hand on his chest. It is gift. They are not excellent, not new, so a very poor gift. <gasps> they are the best gift, said Mum, aren't they? I nodded, feeling so happy that I just wanted to hug the man and the mum and jump up and down all at once. Thank you, sir, I said, giving the man an enormous smile. Welcome, welcome, he said, and smiling back, gave me a pat on the top of my head and waved at us as we left the shop. What a wonderful man, said mum, as she helped me put the pomegranates in my rucksack. He looked like a king, I said, thinking of the ring with the stone in it and his red turban. Mum laughed. He certainly has the heart of one. Maybe he is one. You can never tell with people. Now, seeing as our unexpected adventure is at an end, let's hurry home before it starts to pour. I looked up. Everything had suddenly turned dark and the sky was filled with large grey clouds that were so low you could hear them rumbling. But I didn't care because I had two of the best presents I could ever have in my bag given to me by a man with the heart of a king. <laughs>